That is on now. Okay. All right, open your Bibles this morning to John's Gospel, chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 43 through 54. John chapter 4, verses 43 through 54. Now after two days he departed thence and went into Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. Then when he was coming to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast. For they also went unto the feast. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he had heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he had begun to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed and his whole house. This is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. Again, it's been a little bit of time since we've been in the book of John, but if you remember uh, the previous to this account, Jesus has been dealing with the Samaritan woman. Uh, she'd gotten saved, she got about why she had come to the well, she left her water pots, she went back into the town and told uh, the people about the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and then many came out and Christ preached and there, and there was... And in, in since a great revival, many people were saved. And now Christ says, leaving that area after a really a faithful time of ministering to lost souls, he returns to Galilee, Cana in particular, where he had performed his first miracle and launched his ministry. Now the reason for visiting Cana is not really given, but we can suppose it was the same reason that he had went through Samaria. And the reason was that there was someone there who needed to know him as their Lord and Savior. It's interesting to note that this man's greater need of salvation was met in a time of crisis in his life. James Montgomery Boyce wrote that it does not matter who you may be, sooner or later, you are going to experience great sorrows or even tragedies in your life. You may be rich or poor, man or woman, black or white. Tragedy inevitably will become a part of our personal experience, and there will be nothing that you can do to avoid it. It's kind of amazing to me how this message goes along with what uh, Landon was preaching this morning. Uh, we're going to have trouble, folks. We're going to have trials. We're going to have tribulation. We're going to have difficult times. We're going to have tragedies. We're going to be affected by the, the fact that we live in a fallen world. This is not paradise. Amen? Amen? And so we're going to have to deal with these things. Job, who certainly knew what he was speaking of when it comes to trouble said, For affliction does not come from the dust, nor does trouble spring up from the ground. Yet man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. Sparks in, in the Hebrew literally means the sons of flame. How many of you understand what we're talking about this morning? Life is filled with deep sorrow and difficulty and trouble. You know, I often say this, and I, I know some people take it as sarcasm, but it's true. 
Life is hard, and then you die. That's pretty much what we can expect out of this life. We live in a fallen, sin-filled world. The, the thought of that in Hebrews, the sons of flame, is that men are born to endure the fires of this life and eventually perish in the burning. Now, I don't think that I have to labor this point this morning. We all know, we all know that life is filled with heartaches and disappointments and tragedies. Sometimes they slip up on us. O often they come like clusters of grapes in bunches or like the waves of the sea that seem to come relentlessly pounding away at the shoreline. Our spirits are often bruised and crushed and broken in the midst of these sorrows. The question is, of course, will we be beaten down by them? Or will we triumph over them in victory? Well, I believe that these verses can tell us how the latter can happen. How that out of tragedy can come triumph. And the first thing I want you to notice then is the great sorrow. Look with me, if you would, at verse 46. So Jesus came again into Canaan of, Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine, and there was a certain nobleman whose son was at Capernaum. And then in verse 49, the nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down, ere my die. If, if we as parents or grandparents we're asked to bear our hearts and reveal perhaps our greatest fear, which we're not supposed to do, of course, in our John Wayne Tuff society. But if we were to do that, I, I'm confident that all of us would share that one of our greatest fears is that something would happen to our children or our grandchildren. Chuck Swindoll said, we tend to envision long, full lives for our children. We forget that the first grave dug was for that of a son, not a father. Like a blooming orchard caught in an untimely frost, the fruit of the womb is sometimes nipped coldly in the bud. I think we perhaps could think of the loss of a child as one of the ultimate tragedies. And some of you here this morning have experienced this, maybe even greater than the loss of a spouse, as great as that is. The loss of a child brings great sorrow, and even the threat of it is enough to unnerve even the most stable of lives. In fact, the saddest movies are about children dying before their time, and their sorrow is multiplied a hundredfold in this life. It was that kind of sorrow, that kind of sorrow that the nobleman was facing. Verse 46 says his son was sick. Verse 49, and you can almost sense the tone of his voice here. He points out this sickness was more than a little cold or a stubbed toe. It was the kind of sickness that makes parents despair with a sense of helplessness. In fact, he was at the point of death. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down here, ere my child die. That was the desperation in his life. The man's position. He was a nobleman. He was a royal official. Could not help. He did not have enough money to relieve this concern, enough political power to relieve this concern. And great sorrow was his lot. But in the midst of that, in tragedy, that potential great tragedy, there was hope. Because in the midst of great sorrow, there was a great Savior. Verse 47 through 50. When he heard that Jesus, I love that, was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went into him and he besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, 
ye will not believe. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. Now this nobleman had no doubt heard of the Lord Jesus Christ as he had exposure to the Galileans who had seen Christ work miracles. In fact, verse 45 notes then, when he was coming to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went unto the feast. He knew what he had heard that Jesus that he could heal those afflicted with life's trouble in the form of sickness and disease. With a can he, it was not a matter of can Jesus help me. By his coming and bold request, he was saying, in that, He can help me. He can help me. He can help my child. You see, the beginning of faith is the assurance that God through Christ is equal to any problem we will face in life. My God can do anything. And that power resided in the person of Jesus Christ and resides now in the person of Jesus Christ. In fact, Christ had power to calm the raging sea. With the simple words, peace be still. He had power to turn ordinary water into wine. In fact, he had power to walk on that same water. He had power to restore sight to one born blind. He had power to restore the use of legs to a man paralyzed for 38 years. He had power to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to bring the dead to life simply by his spoken word. You see, where man can't, God can. Man cannot control the elements. I, I would love to be able to get up in the morning instead of checking the weather, see what's going to happen, to dial in my requests. But the reality is we can't control the weather or the elements, but God can. Man cannot cure terminal disease. I know it's partially in manipulation of people, but aren't we always touched by the, the commercials for, say, St. Jude, where they show the little children with, with terminal cancer? Doesn't that touch our hearts? And if we had the ability, wouldn't we want to do something about it? But the reality is we can't. We can't. But God can. Man cannot bring life to the dead, but God can. In fact, with God, nothing is possible. With God, it's not a matter of ability. He is able. We love and serve a Savior who can do. A powerful Savior. But we must turn to Him in faith. Which brings us to the next point. This man's turn, turning to Jesus Christ led to great satisfaction. Verse 51 through 54. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. I, I don't know if you get the power of that. Then, then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend and they saith unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed in his whole house. This is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. And by the way, I'll make, make this mention. John numbers these miracles because Jesus did seven miracles he did a lot more than that, but seven recorded by John, again, proving who Jesus was and, and the fact of what he did. Great satisfaction. 
Because this man believed, not just believed like positive confession, like I will this to happen, but he believed the word of Christ. In verse 50, Jesus' word was, Go thy way, thy son liveth. Because he believed the word of Christ, he acted in confidence. You see, the world says, and sometimes Christians get caught up in this, the world says, seeing is believing. We hear that all the time, right? But Jesus turns that around and teaches that believing is seeing. Again, verse 50, go your way, your son lives. And he went his way. That's faith. Faith is grounded, by the way, in God's word. And then one acts accordingly. And the result is great satisfaction. Again, verse 51. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Can you imagine the release? Can you imagine the burden that was taken away at that very moment? But that wasn't really the best news. The best news is that he and his whole family got saved. Verse 53. So the, the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed, and his whole house. Well, you talk about a double blessing. That's a happy ending, by the way. It's a Hallmark Channel movie. <laughs> Christ can do that for you, by the way. He can bring triumph out of tragedy. Joy out of sadness. Hope where there is no hope. But of course there is a secret to tapping into these great blessings. And that brings us to the next point. The great, fa the great secret is great faith. How did the nobleman receive this great satisfaction? The secret was his faith. He believed Jesus and was rewarded for his faith. This is the essence of saving faith, by the way. I, I, I got I read a quote by Spurgeon. I, I pushed it through on Facebook the other day that I, I cannot be get away from this. We think that faith is the ability to get things from God, and sometimes faith results in that. Okay, don't misunderstand me. But faith is trusting God. It is trusting His Word. Spurgeon said the Christian motto is, trust, trust, trust. Trust what He says. The essence of a faith that God rewards as believing is believing his word, believing and trusting his word. Again, it's not like the positive thinkers, positive confessors. You know, teacher, if you want a pink Cadillac, just say pink Cadillac and just believe that God's going to give you a pink Cadillac. And if you believe enough and say it enough, you're going to get a pink Cadillac. That, you know what that is, folks? That's faith in faith. It, it's almost like sometimes we, this is a little aside, but some, we have to be careful. Sometimes we brag, well, I, I prayed and God answered my prayer. Prayer is powerful, we say. Uh-uh. God is powerful. It's God who does great things, not my puny prayers. All, all my puny prayers is to tap into God's wonderful, amazing, marvelous grace. Him being faithful to what he said he would do, his word. Not just visualize it, name it, claim it, blab it, grab it. The faith that God re rewards is the faith that rests on his word. So what if you neglect his word? What if you don't read the Bible? What if you don't meditate, memorize, build your life upon the Word of God? You're not going to see great results in your life because you're not resting your faith on the Word of God. 
The faith that God rewards is a faith that rests on his word. Not fanciful dreaming. It is believing God's word and acting accordingly. Abraham's a great example. God, Abraham, he's going to have faith, so to speak, a, a, an air through which the blessing would flow. Now, Abraham, at one point, got out of the will of God, tried to force things. The fact is, God honored his word. When they were too old to have children, guess what? They had a 15, 1 through 6, after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what would thou give me, seeing I am childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram had said, Behold, to me thou hast given no And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars if thou to him, so shall thy seed believe and be thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it. To him for righteousness. Abraham believed God's word. Listen to me this morning. Nothing can be received from God but by trusting his word. That includes especially your salvation. Salvation, we're told in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 4, grace, that's unmerited favor. You cannot earn salvation. For by grace are you saved, how? Through faith. Faith what? Believing God's word. And that not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It was grace that healed the nobleman's son in response to the faith of the nobleman. My question this morning is, have you believed God's word to the saving of your soul? Yeah, we all have issues, you know, Difficult times and stuff that we want to take to God in prayer. But folks, this is the big issue. If you have not been reconciled to God through the Lord Jesus Christ, first place, he's not obligated to answer any of your prayers. But also, you're going to spend eternity separated from him in hell. You've got you to believe the bad news as well as the good news. The problem is revealed in his word about salvation that some people have a hard time swallowing. For example, again, before you get saved, you've got to get lost. That is, you've got to understand that you do not deserve heaven. I'm amazed that almost every funeral I go to, they're, they're trying to preach the fellow or woman into heaven. As if everybody's going there. I, newsflash, not everybody deserves heaven. The, well, better news flash, no one deserves it. <laughs> In fact, the Bible tells us, as is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Verse 23 of Romans 3, for all, all means everybody, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's hard for people to accept, but it, again, are you going to believe the word of God by faith? God doesn't grade on a curve. In fact, there's really one sin that we commit multiple sins, all of us, even today. I don't care who you are. But there's one sin that will send you to hell. And that's a rejection of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Secondly, man is separated from God. Romans 5.12, Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. That's... The, you know, usually I share the gospel with people. I tell them that's bad news. The bad news is you're, you're, you're a sinner. You're no good. You've, you've sinned. God owes you nothing except for hell. Amen? Or oh my, depending where you're at. We're separated from God. The good news is 
given to us from his word is that Jesus died for the penalty of your sin. He took your punishment. Romans 5, 8, but that's old English. God demonstrates his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If you want to personify that, put it this way. But God demonstrated his love towards me in that while I was yet sinning, which, by the way, is shaking your fist at God, Christ died for me. Personify it. Make it personal. Make it for yours. Jesus died for our sins. My favorite verse in the Bible, well, most of you know this is my favorite verse, 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he hath made him, capital E, Jesus, made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It's not a matter of me clawing, scraping, trying to earn God's favor. God says, look, if you will believe my word, exercise faith in the person of Jesus Christ, that he died for you, that he will forgive your sins, then he will take your sin and put it on Jesus Christ, and Christ bore the penalty of your sin at the cross. The eternal God died for you at Calvary. In turn, he will take Christ's perfect life. That verse says, who knew no sin. Christ did not ever sin. No, not one time. And he takes his perfect life and clothes you with it. And by the way, if you're saved, you are as positionally as righteous as you're ever going to be. Because you're clothed with the righteousness of Christ. So that when God looks at you, he sees Jesus, not you. Good thing, amen? It's, and it's an instantaneous transaction. As soon as you repent of your sin and ask Christ to save you, that takes place once and for all. You are clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I always, when I read that verse, I say, what a deal. What a deal. So fourthly, you can be saved. If you turn from your sin, doesn't mean... Give up all your sin, get perfect before you get saved. But a willingness, you know, you have one or two masters in your life. You have sin as your master if you, you have Christ as your master. Repentance is turning your back on sin and turning to Christ and asking him to save you. And you know what? According to his word, when you do that in faith, he will save you. And fully and freely forgive you and clothe you for the, with the righteousness of of Christ, And by the way, that gives you complete access to him in prayer. Is he going to take away every trial? Not necessarily, because I was thinking about this this morning. We have our agenda, he has her, his agenda. And you know what? Our agenda is flawed, his is perfect. I, I, we've been, you know, our church and me personally, the last couple of years have been tough. But I praise the Lord for it, because it... Sometimes God allows things in our life just to draw us back to him because he wants that intimacy. He wants that close relationship to him. And so we should, we should just trust, trust. Listen, this is our motto. Trust, trust, trust. Amen? Trust him. He knows what he's doing. Trust him with your soul. Trust him with your life. And there are times when we pour out our hearts to him that he gives us a supernatural desire for our benefit. And praise the Lord for those times. In the times that he doesn't, he gives us a supernatural bearing up through those difficult times and draws us close to him. Amen? That's why James says, count it all joy when you face various trials, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting or literally lacking nothing. Trust him. Trust his word. And be blessed. Let's pray.